Oh, hello there. I'm Shinky, welcome to Shinky JRPGs, and welcome to my review for Infinity Strash, Dragon Quest, The Adventure of Dai. Do you remember your first JRPG that introduced you into the genre? That one experience that solidified your love for the genre and made you a lifelong fan? Dragon Quest, at that time known as Dragon Warrior, was that game for me. I was the nice young age of four, my babysitter was playing Dragon Quest, and I had no idea what was going on. But I loved the cute little monsters and the sounds coming from the television. I was taught to play the game at that point, learned how to read because of Dragon Quest, and that's when I started to adore the genre. Now, while all of this is nice and cute, that's where it ends. It's because I love Dragon Quest so much that this game hurt me. The game failed to deliver on so many aspects, but why does it fail to deliver? Well, that's what I'm here to talk about. So pull up a chair, grab a drink, and get ready to dive into Infinity Strash, Dragon Quest The Adventure of Dai. Okay, so let's start this review off on a positive note. The story of Infinity Strash is incredibly good. It's pretty standard Dragon Quest fare. Infinity Strash focuses on Dai, an orphan who lives on Dermine Island and has always dreamed of becoming a hero. One day, a group of bandits infiltrates Dai's island and kidnaps his buddy Gomachan, the Golden Metal Slime. During Dai's adventure to rescue Gomachan, Dai runs into Avan, the trainer of heroes who decides to take Dai on as a pupil to combat the inevitable return of the ancient Dark Lord Hadlar. The story is classic Dragon Quest. Travel across the land, gaining the power to defeat the Dark Lord that has been resurrected. It's nothing new, and it's not anything you haven't seen before, but honestly, it's quite enjoyable. While the story is interesting and fun to experience, I was quite disappointed by how it's delivered to the player. While the story is completely voice acted, most of the cutscenes are nothing but static images. I just found myself getting bored when they talk about high action sequences, but all you see is an image that slowly pans across your screen with a greeny filter on it. It was incredibly disappointing, especially when they're super long with rare gameplay sequences. For those of you that are fans of the anime, the story of Infinity Strash covers about the first 40 episodes, so if you've watched the anime, you know exactly what to expect. It's nice to actually experience the story in another form of media. Anyways, let's get into the gameplay mechanics. So this is the beginning of my disappointment of the game. When I first saw the trailer of this game, I was incredibly excited. An open world Dragon Quest spinoff? I was pumped. Absolutely thrilled to experience a beautiful world, exploration, sword and magic combos, and hunting out hidden items. Sign me up, I'm all for it. Then I started playing the game. None of this is in the game at all. I've never been so misled by a trailer since Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles The Crystal Bears. First of all, there's no world to explore. Dai only has one combo, and no hidden items to hunt for at all. Such a lost opportunity to have an amazing open world action RPG. Really a shame. There are four playable characters, however, unfortunately, they all more or less play the same. A single attack combo with various special abilities that don't really combo all that well. The gameplay just feels super clunky, almost budget PS2 action RPG like. At least the party has different types of gameplay. New characters are swordsmen, but they share abilities more or less. It makes sense story-wise as they're trained by the same person, but it's still annoying. Anyways, then you have your spellcaster who gets classic spells like Frizz, Crackle, and Boom. And then you have a healer with gun spells. She literally shoots spells out of her gun. And instead of cooldowns, you have to reload the gun so that you can use the spell again. Each character also has a special command. Dai can enter a powered up mode, the spellcaster can hold the button to reduce spell charge time, and the gun mage can reload her gun spells. As well as one super move, or coup de gras, that does incredible amounts of damage. It's nice each character plays a little differently, but the combat just doesn't flow smoothly. It's just super clunky and feels unresponsive because every action has a huge amount of delay afterwards. The delay is especially bad when it comes to your defensive options. You have two options for defense. You can guard, or you can parry by guarding right as you get hit. And then you also have a dodge button. 
It's more effective to just dodge attacks as it seems to be a delay from when you press guard and the guard actually happens, leading you to take damage when you really shouldn't. Anyways, how about progression? How do you progress in the game from one area to the next? Well, when you are on the world map, you select the next area, there are three options. One looks like a book. This is the most common. It's just story where it's a cutscene delivering the story to you. Then the second most common is a crossed swords icon. This is an action stage. Most of the action stages are just boss fights and don't take very long. Generally about five minutes long unless you struggle with the boss fight. It's a bit disheartening though when you watch 40 minutes of cutscenes followed by a five minute boss fight and then another hour of cutscenes. This happens several times. Rarely you get a stage that consists of killing all of the enemies. Maybe five of these stages of the whole game, but they're just linear pathways. You kill all the enemies and then go into the next area. The only exception to this is there is one stage in the whole game where it's a stealth section where you have to make it through to the end without being seen. If you are seen, it's just another kill all the enemies and progress to the next part. I found it easier to do that because the line of sight was a little bit off. Anyways, the last world map icon looks like a monster. These are free battles. Free battles are essentially repeatable battles that are used to level up your characters, but they have separate short side stories. They were a nice break from the incredible amount of long cutscenes. Now, let's talk about the Temple of Recollection. The prime way to power up your characters. The equipment system is in the form of bond memories, short cutscenes that result in obtaining a card. You can equip these cards to increase your character's stats, from magic to strength to critical hit rate and critical hit damage. However, when you get these bond memories, they are relatively weak. So how do you power them up? Well, this is where the Temple of Recollection comes in. In order to power up these bond memories, as well as your skills, you need to traverse through this randomly generated dungeon and collect materials. Then you use these materials and can upgrade the level of your bond memories. Though I find this dungeon incredibly boring, first of all, you start at level 1 each time you enter it, and it's laid out in the form of layers. Each layer has 5 stages. Each stage, you need to kill all of the enemies, and then select a door to go through focusing on what you want to power up, and then proceed to the next stage and do it all over again. At the 5th floor of each layer, you will fight a boss. After each layer, you can choose either to go back to the entrance and reap the rewards, or you can continue deeper to get better rewards. It's incredibly repetitive and boring. Unfortunately, until the very late game, this is the only way to power up your skills, and it is the only way to power up your bond memories. So it's necessary unless you want to be severely underpowered. Alright, that's enough. It's time to be positive again. Okay, I know that the gameplay section might have made the game sound absolutely terrible, but trust me, there is a breath of fresh air. Oh my gosh. Infinity Strash is freaking gorgeous. I absolutely adore this art style. Shockingly, the game's art is not done by Akira Toriyama, but instead Koji Inada. Honestly, this game is possibly one of the most beautiful cel shaded games I have ever played. The brightness and colors really bring every monster, boss, and character to life, and is such a treat for the eyes. Sure, most of the areas are lush forests and dry deserts, but they look so good. I won't lie, that was one of the first things I noticed in the initial trailer. The incredible environments. The rest of the trailer may have disappointed and misled me, but the visuals absolutely did not. The character designs aren't absolutely mind-blowing, but I still think they look great. And I love the monsters. The Dragon Quest monsters are always so amazing, and they have never looked as good as they look now. The colors really make them shine. I never knew trash could look so good. Take this as a lesson. You can have the worst crap in existence, but if it's cell shaded in HD, at least it'll look good. So we've talked about the gameplay, we've talked about the story, and the art style, as well as the graphics. So how is the music? Is it great? Well, I wouldn't say it's amazing. But then again, I wouldn't call it offensively bad either. It's quite middle of the road for me personally. 
The music during the cutscenes is really well done. In fact, it's pulled right from the anime. Incredibly appropriate. And the music during the gameplay? It's alright. Honestly, no music really stood out for me as extraordinary, but it's enjoyable for sure. Granted, Dragon Quest has never had incredibly stellar music, save for the few common themes such as the standard level up music. And of course, the classic Dragon Quest Overture. Classic Dragon Quest, I love it. Unfortunately, none of these themes are in the game at all. So, how long should you expect to spend with Infinity Strash, Dragon Quest, The Adventure of Dai? That name is incredibly long. Probably longer than the game itself. Anyways, honestly, it's not a very long game. My main playthrough, with doing minimal Temple of Recollection and focusing on story, only took me 12 hours. Now, after you beat the game, you do unlock a hard mode, or a challenge mode. However, I really didn't waste my time with it. I had enough of this once I saw the ending. This was kind of a shocker because Dragon Quest titles are generally quite long, where this one just was not. As for pacing, it sucks. They were the suckiest bunch of sucks that ever sucked. Yeah, see, Homer knows what's up. The pacing of the game is downright awful. I mentioned it previously, but it's not uncommon to go up to an hour of static image cutscenes, followed by 5-10 to 10 minutes of gameplay, only to watch another hour of cutscenes. It's honestly exhausting. If I wanted to watch the anime, I would watch the anime. Literal, visual novel levels of cutscenes. Get that visual novel out of my action RPG. Shame on you. So, final verdict on the game? Awful. It is by no means worth full price, and honestly, I would just suggest you watch the anime. You will get a much more enjoyable experience at a lower price point. As an incredible fan of Dragon Quest, this game really disappointed me, especially since I was really excited for the game. Honestly, if you really love the anime and want a game that tells the same story, you might enjoy Infinity Strash, but that is a huge might. This is one of the most disappointing games in 2023 that I've played so far. Despite my review and personal opinions, are you picking up Infinity Strash Dragon Quest The Adventure of Die? Let me know in the comments below. Or if you've already played it, let me know your thoughts on it. Did you enjoy my review? If so, don't be afraid to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm always hanging out in the comments and I read and appreciate each and every one of them. Anyways, that's the meat and potatoes, folks. Thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful day.